today is a special day in the life of our church as we dedicate to the Lord Sadie Elena Cooper. This is an important part of our church life. As Jesus commanded us, he told us to let the children come to him, for such is the, the kingdom of God. And so as we do this today, it's not just a ritual, but it's an important part of our church life. And so as we begin in this time, would you join me in a word of prayer? Mighty God, by your love, we are given children through the miracle of birth. We give you thanks. May we greet each new son and daughter with joy and surround them, with, them all with faith so that they may know who you are and want to be your disciples. Never let us neglect children but help us to delight in them, showing them the welcome you have shown us all through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Isaac Mario, in presenting Sadie Elena Cooper to the Lord, do you promise independence upon God's grace and with the help of the church to teach your child the gifts and claims of faith and by prayer, word, and example to bring her up in the nurture discipline, and instruction of the Lord. Sisters and brothers of the household of faith, I commend to you this family. Your love, care, and example are as necessary to this covenant as their faithfulness in keeping their promise. Will you do all in your power to make this church a true spiritual home for them, giving them the support of your prayers and of your example? With God's help. Okay, now we're going to behave, right? This is, all, this is like in ministry, the scariest moments I ever faced right here. But I want to introduce you. I want you to see this beautiful child, Sadie Elena Cooper. And I looked up Sadie Elena, and of course, Mario was telling me this morning that these are actually family names, Sadie uh, comes from her great aunt. Um, also, uh, Elena comes from her great grandmother. Uh, it was a shortened name for her great grandmother. And so, as I look up her name, and I love looking up names and seeing what they mean, and Sadie in the original Hebrew means princess. And so I think that kind of fits. This is a little princess that I'm walking around with right now. But Elena is from the Greek translation, and it means of light. So, princess of light. I know y'all planned that, right? Yeah. Princess of light. You want to shake hands? She's reaching out for you. So, But this is beautiful a beautiful opportunity for us to be reminded of what's important in our church lives. Every time that we have a baby dedication in this church, I think about all of those who helped me grow in my faith throughout the years, who planted seeds of faith in my life and trained me and taught me and loved me through all of those times. And the promise that we have made this morning is the same thing, is that we are promising to love her, to teach her, and to help her grow in her faith, and showing the example of how others have loved us in different ways. And so we're about finished with our walk. I think I'll go out the front door and just take her with me. So, but what a beautiful baby on a beautiful day as we come to this place to dedicate Sadie. Got it. Would you join me in a prayer of dedication? 
God of grace, parent of us all, we pray for these parents and all parents. Help Isaac and Mariel to know you and to love with your love, to teach your truth, and to tell the story of faith to their child so that your word may be heard and done. Bless Sadie. Guard her safely through injury and illness so that she may live the promise you give. And keep us with this child and with all children ready to listen and to love, even as in Jesus Christ you have loved us, your grown-up children. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Good morning. It is so good to see you here on this holiday weekend. I know we're missing some familiar faces who are away, but we're glad that you are here for worship this morning. Just a few announcements as we begin our time together. Um, just a reminder that our church office will be closed tomorrow in observance of the holiday, and we'll be back to normal hours on Tuesday morning. As the announcements were scrolling through, you probably saw a slide advertising the Green River tubing trip. If that is something that you are interested in, there has been one slight change as of this morning. That date originally was July 11th. We're going to move it to July the 12th. Tommy also has a golf fellowship that night, but Andrew promised that you would be back in time to play golf. So if you're interested in signing up for the tubing trip, you may do that when the pew pads are passed in just a few moments. If you will notice in your bulletin, we have lots of children who are heading to camp Tuesday bright and early. And if you will be in prayer for us, um, while we are at Montreat at Passport Kids Camp, we would certainly appreciate it. It is always an incredible camp that our children ages third, fourth, and fifth grade go to. And I know that this year will be as wonderful as all the others have been in the past. As I've already mentioned, if you will begin to pass the pee pads found in the center aisle, um, you can use that to sign up for anything that we have got going on here at the church in the next few weeks, and we'll be glad to um, make a note of that. Again, we're so glad that you're here for worship. Will you pray with me? God, for this day, we give you thanks. Help us to open our hearts, our minds, and our ears so that we may feel your presence as we come together to worship in this place. I pray for all of those who are leading us today, that you will guide them and that we may hear the message brought before us. In your precious and holy name, I pray. Amen.
Our responsive reading is found in your order of worship this morning. It's taken from selected passages throughout the Old and New Testament. Would you join me as we read responsively? I will walk among you and will be your God, and you shall be my people. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that hath made us. We are his, we are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. He it is who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify for himself a people of his own who are zealous for good deeds. You are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple of the Lord, in whom you are also built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, for the gift of this day, we give thanks. And Father, this weekend, we celebrate the freedoms that we enjoy in this country. But Father, most importantly, we come here today to this place to worship and to praise you because of the freedom that is found through the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. And so, Father, as we do that and as we prepare to give, we pray that you would bless these tithes and offerings and that you would use them to spread the incredible news of your love throughout this world. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning. I'm very excited to come before you today on behalf of the Pastor Search Committee to announce that we have brought to the Deacon Board a unanimous recommendation of a candidate to be the next pastor of First Baptist Church. I really expected there. I was expecting fireworks, but that'll do. As you know, this process began in June of 2021. So this decision reflects more than a year of meetings, listening sessions, interviews, visits, conversations, video sermons, and prayers. Our committee believes that these prayers have led us to this candidate. Our call weekend will take place July 29th through July 31st. This weekend, we will host multiple opportunities for you to meet this candidate and get to know him and his family. Sunday morning, July 31st, this candidate will join us to preach, and at the end of that service, we will hold a congregational vote to call our next minister. Over the next few weeks, our committee will be sharing information with you about this man and his family so that you can begin to feel the excitement we feel about our future together in this place. I will remind you, though, that the Baptist call method creates some obstacles with sharing information about the candidate. Realistically, until our vote July 31st, this candidate does not have a job at First Baptist Lawrence. And just as we have been hurt when ministers left this place, <laughs> his current church will feel those same emotions. Therefore, we must keep his name confidential to protect him and to protect us all. For today, let me share my confidence that this candidate is the one. This week, as Andrew had COVID and Megan was in class, Susan and I had our grandchildren. One day, they brought me this treasury of literature for children and asked me to read to them. As they crawled into my lap and asked, I asked which story, the book fell open to one of our favorites, Beowulf. No, it wasn't actually Beowulf. <laughs> it was Goldilocks and the Three Bears. We'll get to Beowulf maybe next year. As I read them this story of how some porridge is too hot and some porridge is too cold, and how some beds are too hard and some too soft, I was reminded of this search, of the times of frustration and impatience and wondering where God was leading us all. I'm happy to say today that our committee believes that we have found a minister who is just right, a man who possesses all of those impossible traits that you described in our congregational conversations, or at least comes as close as we can possibly expect. I'll share two more things this morning that I see as confirmation of our committee's decision. The first came when I went to visit this candidate's church one Sunday. I sneaked in at the last minute to try to avoid meeting anyone. I masked up because COVID provides good cover for a visiting search committee member. <laughs> I sat near the back for a quick exit. Finally, as the prelude started, I felt safe and I looked around the sanctuary. And what I saw was a chandelier a single chandelier, but a chandelier just like the ones I see here every Sunday morning. Now I know that these chandeliers exist in Baptist churches all over the country, that there was probably some sort of sale at the Baptist, Baptist supply store or Baptist R Us. But for me, that chandelier felt like a sign that I was in the right place, listening to the right man. The other confirmation I'll share with you has to do with the rainbow that you see on the screen. Choir, there's a rainbow on the screen. I know many of you saw the same rainbow Thursday because you posted it on social media, hovering over the golf course, kissing your cow pasture, glinting down on the Walmart parking lot. What you'll recognize in this photo though is that this photo, sorry, I lost my place, this view uh, is, has the photo ending in the entrance to the Family Life Center. This view is the one that the pastor search team saw when we emerged from our meeting Thursday night, having voted to call a new minister and settled on a call weekend. It's hard not to believe in God's promise when that promise is demonstrated so beautifully. We look forward to you getting to know this man. Will you pray with me? Dear God, we thank you today for symbols for reminders of your promises, for reminders of your guidance. God, we know that just as you provided a cloud by day and a fire by night, you continue to lead your people. We know that by the sacrifice of the cross and the promise of the empty tomb, 
you offer each of us the hope of salvation through your Son. We know that your guidance is perfect and your promises never ending. We gather today in celebration, Lord, in celebration of finding a new pastor, in celebration of our country, in celebration of your love for us, and in celebration of the many ways we see that love manifested in our lives. We thank you today for the reminders of that love, for your guidance, for your comfort, for your healing, for your forgiveness, for your grace. We pray today for those who don't feel these reminders, for the lost, for the hopeless, for the sick, for those in need. We ask you, Lord, to help us be instruments of your love. We ask you, Lord, to make us reflections of your grace. We ask you, Lord, to help us forgive as we have been forgiven. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, David. In spite of the dirty look, I thank you. And I want to thank the entire pastor search committee who has done outstanding work over these months, work filled with dedication and persistence. Um, <clears throat> it's never easy to be on a committee like that. Thank you for your work. I'm excited for the committee. I'm excited for First Baptist Church and for a new chapter of ministry that will soon begin. So, um, blessings, and we are celebrating today. We're celebrating the announcement that was just made, but tomorrow being the 4th of July, Independence Day, we're celebrating as a country the freedoms that we enjoy and the, the land in which we live. Maybe it's a good time for us to talk about God and country. And so my scripture passage is about that. It's found in Matthew 22, beginning with verse 15. Matthew 22, verse 15, we'll listen to what Jesus said about God and country. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him, meaning Jesus, in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not. But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius. And he asked them, Whose image is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. And he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. This is the word of God. For the people of God. Thanks be to God. I remember the first time that I went to see the Statue of Liberty. It was July the 3rd, 1963, 59 years ago today. But we weren't just normal tourists going to see the Statue of Liberty. My family had lived in Germany for a year. And we were coming back home on an ocean liner in the days when that's how you cross the ocean rather than a plane. We were excited about coming back into our country, eager to be back in the good old U.S. of A. And in fact... In the middle of the ocean, my sister and I came down with the 10-day measles. 
what we called the red measles back then, the big one. And I learned the meaning of quarantine very early on. <laughs> we had to be the last ones off this huge ship. And so we were so ready to get home, get to America. So on early in the morning, on July the 3rd, we sail into the New York Harbor. It's foggy. We're looking out of our portal window, looking for the Statue of Liberty, for that great beacon, that great symbol, as David just talked about. I looked, I looked, I looked through the fog, I looked, and never saw it. Never saw the Statue of Liberty. You see, we were on the wrong side of the ship. I've thought about that over the years as I've thought about what it means to be an American citizen. We're all looking for liberty. We're all wanting the, the liberty and the freedoms that we can have, the full experience of this freedom that was declared on Independence Day and that was fought in a revolutionary war and that then was shaped in a constitution as a country began Everyone's looking for liberty in our lives. But we all look through the confines of our own cabins. You see, we're looking for liberty, but we all look kind of based on our own experiences of life. And these experiences shape our, our politics, our economics, our religion, our, our race, our... Um, just the experiences of life form the window through which we are looking for liberty. So how do we know if we're on the right side of the ship? How do we know if what we're looking for, if we can even see it from the vantage point of our own lives? There's no lack of of voices out there trying to tell us how to find this liberty and freedom. You get it from politicians and preachers, from pundits and commentators, all kind of folks telling us what the American ideal and the dream and what our freedom should mean. But we're all looking at that through our own cabins, through the windows of our own experience and that limits what we can see. We need a different vantage point. We need a vantage point that's not so much out of the cabin window of our own lives, but we need a vantage point that's from the captain's bridge, where you can see everything from up looking out where the captain sees. And of course, the captain of our lives in terms of our faith is Jesus. So what would Jesus say to us about how we can live as citizens of our land, that we're thinking about this weekend, but also citizens of the kingdom of God? How does Jesus teach us from the vantage point of the captain's bridge how we're to experience God and country? So that brings us to the story I read. And our story begins with an either-or trap. No sooner do we start reading the story that we learn there's a snare, there's a trap that's being set. Verse 15, then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. So the questions that were being asked were not from seekers who were really trying to understand the truth and get to the, the bottom of something. They instead were from some of the enemies of Jesus who were trying to get him in trouble and trap him and ensnare him in his words. And so here's how they did it. They offered him an either or question. The question, tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? 
Yes or no, either or. It's, it's just one or the other. And they thought they had him trapped. Now, nobody likes to pay taxes. I don't know, is there anybody in here that's just really excited about paying taxes? But it was, it was very different back in this day. You see, in our day, we live in a country, a democracy, a republic, so we pay taxes, but then we have some benefits. So taxes we might pay can pave roads and can fund education and can have military defense. There are things that can come from the taxes we pay. So even if we bemoan paying them, we have some say through our representative government and how that works. This was not true in Jesus' day. The tax that was there, this imperial tax, was one imposed by Rome. Rome who had come and, and conquered and then was taxing the people. So what would be paid would go into the coffers of Rome. It wouldn't help the, the Jews in any way. In fact, to pay this tax, they used a denarius. And on that denarius was an image or an icon of Caesar. So the whole idea of making a graven image of, of anyone that would appear godlike, that was repulsive to the Jews. And now they were forced to fund what happened in Rome by this oppressive tax. So Jesus, we got you now. Are you for it or against it? Either or. What are you going to say? They thought they had him trapped. And one other dimension here, you need to know who, who they is. Verse 15, we see that the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him. Verse 16, they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Pharisees and Herodians. You may have heard those words before, but may not know the Pharisees strongly objected to paying this tax to Caesar. It was repulsive for them to, to even use a, a coin that had Caesar's image on it. And the Pharisees, as a group, opposed the tax. The Herodians were supporters of the family of Herod. The Herodians were ones who felt like we need to go along and get along with the, the Romans. They were wealthier folks. They chose the path of accommodation. So they didn't want to upset the Romans at all, and they favored paying the tax. So do you have all the politics in place here? Pharisees against the tax. Herodians for the tax, and they both came to Jesus and asked him this either-or question. Well, he couldn't win, it seemed like. You know, if he said one thing, if he said yes, he could be charged by the Pharisees as being a collaborator with the hated Romans. If he said no, he could be charged by the Herodians with treason for disobeying Caesar. I can just hear them now. We got you, Jesus. <laughs> these ones who were the enemies of Jesus, these ones who were concerned about Jesus and his ministry and the way that he seemed to be threatening their hierarchy, their establishment. So what did Jesus say? The way of Jesus was not either or. It was both and. That was often the way of Jesus. There are other occasions where people came and posed either or questions, but Jesus often came up with a both and answer. So Jesus said, let me see the coin. Whose image is on the coin? Well, it was Caesar's. And Jesus gave this simple explanation that, that really it was his way of saying, you know, it's not either or, it's God 
and country. So he took the coin, Caesar's image was on it, and he said, give back to Caesar, or another translation, render to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar, and to God the things that belong to God. It's not either or, it's both and. We're to be good citizens of our country and we're to be good citizens of the kingdom of God. It's both and. Sometimes there's a tension there. Sometimes there's a, there's a tension about how all that gets along. Sometimes it's easier just to live in an either-or world where you, you shut out one side and it's just right or wrong, yes or no, black or white, you know. It can be a little harder to live in a both-and world where it's, yes, we're to be fully citizens of our country and of the kingdom, it's both-and. So in these words, Jesus gave two principles that I want us to think about, and even on the 4th of July, as, as our country is shooting off fireworks and thinking about uh, the freedoms we enjoy as a country, think about these two principles. In this short answer of Jesus, he gives them to us, and I think he's giving them to us, teaching us how to be citizens of both our country and the kingdom of God. First principle is this, separation is essential for freedom. Separation is essential for freedom. Jesus was very clear. We are to be involved in both things, the support of Caesar, the support of God. But he was also clear, those are two different things. And so we render to Caesar that which is Caesar's, and we render to God that which is God's. But those are different things. Now, in our Baptist tradition, going all the way back to when we got started as Baptists in the early 1600s in England, there came this idea of religious liberty and this idea that later was fleshed out in our country of separation of church and state. It happened because when we were born in the early 1600s, there was no separation of church and state. You had the Church of England, and if you were born in England, you were born into that church. You had no choice, no choice. And some Baptists began reading their Bibles and began seeing that's not what the church should be made up of. The church should be people who are born again, believers who are baptized, not as infants automatically into the church that's tied to the state, but we should be a church filled with what we're called regenerate believers. And Baptists began to break away and they got in trouble for this. And they also realized that the taxes they paid supported the Church of England, and they were trying to break from the church. So in those early days, Baptists said, we must have religious liberty, we must separate church and state. That happened in England, came over into America, that emphasis of the Baptists was strong, people like John Leland were very influential as a Baptist preacher on getting the Bill of Rights that would allow us to have a freedom of religion. And so we hear these words from Jesus, these powerful words about rendering to Caesar and rendering to God, but about keeping them separate. My Baptist history professor in seminary was a man named Dr. Walter Sheridan. He wrote this in a book about freedoms. He said, religious freedom is the historic Baptist affirmation of freedom of religion, freedom for religion, freedom from religion, insisting that Caesar is not Christ and Christ is not Caesar. They're separate. 
And that's what Jesus was saying when, when they tried to ensnare him. And he said, render to Caesar that which belongs to Caesar, and to God that which belongs to God. Keep them separate. That's the first principle. And that's so important to keep freedoms alive. And that's why early on the Bill of Rights provided the amendment about how the government is not to uh, establish religion. So we, we have churches that are free to worship without government interference. It's not that way in every country. Many countries, the, the government literally mandates what I could say in a place like this, but we have the freedom, and aren't we great? One way that we keep that is keeping that religious liberty and that separation of church and state. There's a second principle. If the first principle is separation, which is essential for freedom, the second one is engagement, which is necessary for responsibility. It almost sounds like the opposite. Separation, keep separate, engagement, <laughs> get connected. I love what Viktor Frankl said. He, uh, he looked at the Statue of Liberty on the East Coast, and he said, you know, because America has a Statue of Liberty on the East Coast, we really should have a Statue of Responsibility on the West Coast. And we live in between those two. It's not just about liberty and freedoms. It's about responsibility. So Jesus, that's exactly what he was saying. He was saying, now keep separate, render Caesar, God. But he was using this word that my translation, the NIV, said give back. Other translations say render. It really means to to invest in, to give to, to be committed to. When you render something, you're investing your life so that something can happen, something positive. So how do we render to our country? Because that's what he said to do, render unto Caesar that which belongs to Caesar. So we, we pay taxes. We cast votes. We try to be good citizens. We discuss the issues of the day. We render, we give back to make our country a better place. Maybe this is a good thing for you to ponder on the 4th of July as you pull away from barbecue and before the fireworks, somewhere in there, you might think about the question, what am I rendering? or giving back to make my country a better place. Jesus told us to do that. What am I doing to give back to make my country a better place? But Jesus also said, render to God the things that belong to God. So we sort of know what the country requires, you know, following the laws and paying taxes and voting and all those things. What does God require? That sounds like a Bible verse. What does the Lord require of you? You remember that one? Micah 6, 8. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with your God? That's what God requires. And so if we render to our country what our country requires, and we try to think, what, what am I doing that will help my country? What does God require? Well, there are three things. To do justice. To find where things are wrong and try to make them right. That's what justice is, literally the meaning of that word. So God is saying... That's what we're to do. We're to do justice. We're also to love kindness and mercy. We're to have this kind of loving kindness as we relate to people. 
So it's not just making things right, it's also making things right with a spirit of love and mercy and kindness. And as we do that, because that's a tall order, as we do that, we do it by walking humbly with our God. Not racing out ahead, not running behind, not getting too far off away from God, walking humbly with our God in the steps of God following. That's what we render to God, walking humbly with God. And the interesting thing to me is that when we render to God what God wants, when we literally work for justice and demonstrate love and mercy and kindness and walk humbly with God, that will make us good citizens of our country. Isn't that, isn't that what our country needs for people who are working for justice, for people who in a day of great division and, and polarization are, are living for kindness, and for people who understand that we are one nation under God. But as we demonstrate faithfulness, God is who matters most. We are under God. And so, on this 4th of July, Independence Day weekend, let's go back and hear this story of Jesus. They tried to entangle him. They tried to trap him. But he wouldn't get trapped in an either-or situation. Instead, he was saying, you know, I'm calling you to be the best citizens you can be of your country and of the kingdom of God. And if you will live out what God requires and render to God the things that are God's, that will prepare you to be wonderful citizens in Lawrence, Lawrence County, South Carolina, the United States of America. Our land, our country needs more people committed to giving back to God exactly what God wants from us. God and country. So the very last line of this passage, when they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. I'm amazed by Jesus. Aren't you? Let's pray about that. Loving God, we really do want to be the best citizens we can be of a a country we love. And we want to be the best followers. Jesus as we're citizens of the kingdom of God. Take these simple words that were a response to a tricky trap, but help them to speak to us clearly as we think on this celebration weekend what it means to be American, what it means to be Christian. May these principles from our Baptist heritage, be alive and well in our church and in our lives today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Is there a response that you would have? Perhaps your response to a sermon like this is to renew your commitment to being a better citizen of the kingdom of God and of our land. But there may be a a decision you want to share publicly to profess your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, to move your membership into this church family. We're going to sing hymn number 395, God of grace and God of glory. I'll be right here at the front to receive you if there's a public decision that you would like to make. Let's stand. Let's sing. I invite you to come.
I'm glad that we've all joined for worship on this day. I hope you are glad that you came to this place where we can join with a family in dedicating a new gift from God, where we can join with the larger family to think about the privilege of citizenship. And now we go from this place. I hope you'll have a wonderful holiday tomorrow. I hope that the week will be opportunities for service and we'll gather once again next Sunday. To worship God. So as we go, Christ go before you to prepare a way of service. Christ go behind you to gather up all of your efforts for His glory. Christ go beside you as leader and guide. Christ go within you as comfort and stay. Christ go beneath you to uphold with everlasting arms. Christ go above you to reign as Lord Supreme. Amen.